Less than half is now 75. And I heard him say, he figures that since dogs live an average of 10 to 12 years, he has two to go. <laughs> now that's preventive thinking. In a national survey of boomers asking when you will be old, the average they came up with was 79. So we've expanded the landscape of the middle years from 40 to 80, a whole second half of life. The age of Social Security in the U.S., 65, is a meaningless number. That law was passed back in 1935 when life expectancy for Americans was 61. Today, for American men who reach age 65, life expectancy is 83. For women, it's 85. And one out of every four Americans who reach 65 today will live past 90. But we face two great health care emergencies in the first half of the 21st century. The first is the caregiving crisis, and the second is the epidemic of Alzheimer's disease. Family caregiving, and especially long-term care, has become a predictable crisis for Americans in midlife. I know I started taking care of my husband and when he first had cancer, and I've cared for him through three battles with cancer over the course of 17 years. It was the toughest thing I've ever done. Our initiation usually starts with the call. It's a call about a fall or a cardiac arrest. Or the call is about your dad. He's run a red light. He's hit somebody, but he doesn't quite remember how it happened. Is it his eyes or is it his mind? You don't really want to know because you know you're not going to win the argument over the car keys. You listen to conflicting advice from friends. You consult with different doctors, go offer different opinions. Uh, if surgery is needed, you try to find out how many times that hospital has done that procedure. It's very, very difficult to find out. Sooner or later, much later, it dawns on you that your life is changing radically too. You are adopting a new role, caregiver. And the biggest hurdle is that most people don't identify as caregivers. Women say, well, it's just what I do as a daughter or as a wife but it's a professional level role today. And boy, do you need a, a circle of care, because this is a job nobody applies for, nobody's been trained for it, you don't expect it. A West Coast woman entrepreneur told me uh, about the shock she got when her mother was immobilized after the fall. The entrepreneur <coughs> said, you know, I had nine months to prepare for the birth of my child. I had about nine hours to prepare for the dependence of my mother. In one in four American families, somebody is performing the role of family caregiver for another adult who used to be independent. And the average family caregiver today is a 49-year-old woman who holds a paying job, spends at least 20 hours on the role, still has a child or children at home. And this is all at the expense of her teenage children, her mate, her friends, and most of all, uh, at the expense of her own health and well-being and future financial security. More than half of American family caregivers hold full-time jobs, and the caregiver spends an average of five years on this role, with the needs escalating. She often has to give up her job and sacrifice her own uh, future financial security. We all feel like, what am I doing wrong? The answer is nothing. You're doing so much right. I know you know that the presence of a family member who will act as a fearless advocate is a matter of survival. Well, the secret of caregiving success took me years to discover. Quite simply, you cannot do it alone. No one can. We must create a circle of care. And that's why I wrote my book, Passages in Caregiving, to try to show how. Creating a circle of care means growing a network of family, friends, neighbors, colleagues to work, and most important, most valuable, veteran caregivers, because they can show you the rules. And maybe finding college students who are studying nursing or health, health sciences and who would be willing to volunteer and might be able to gain credit for helping a family caregiver. <clears throat> I recently learned from Dan Sokolow, who's director of the MacArthur Genius Awards, about a unique two-way communications platform that's available on the patient's smartphone or on the landline. It connects doctors and a long-distance caregiver in a healthcare team to create a network specific to the individual patient. Early Bird Alert, it's called, 
is free and is provided only through approved health care plans. So it's something I think you should check out. As people are living longer, the global sleep of Alzheimer's will come with astronomical costs for families and for public health budgets. This is becoming a problem in every country, in Europe and Asia, where the expected lifespan is beyond 70 or 80. And there, Japan and a lot of European countries are aging faster than we are even here in America. Dr. Sam Gandhi, a neurologist and psychiatrist at Mount Sinai Hospital, is an international expert on Alzheimer's. I met with him this week to learn about a new test he's pioneered that can pre-diagnose the disease years before, maybe even decades before, first symptoms appear. He began our conversation with a sticker shock I'll never forget. Every family member who develops Alzheimer's will cost somebody a million dollars. A million dollars. Why? The average lifespan after diagnosis is 10 years. And many Alzheimer's patients are perfectly healthy in almost every other regard. The caregiver can easily spend $100,000 a year to take care of a stricken spouse or parent or in-law. This epidemic is so disturbing that we mostly deny it and fail to address it. But now there's also some good news. The onset of memory loss can be delayed, and once a person has the diagnosis, the progression can be slowed. It's very recently been proven that exercise has a delaying effect. <clears throat> the best prevention is 30 minutes of cardiac movement or strength training, training at least three times a week. You've heard that before and for many other uh, illnesses, but also for delaying Alzheimer's. The other